So, birthplace of empires. This is a map of where we are, well, where we've been. Um, we, we cruised through the Suez Canal down here and the, the Gulf of Suez, then up the Gulf of Aqaba. All of this is part of the Red Sea when we visited Petra. Is it okay? Are we? <laughs> okay. Um, and, you know, we're down in the Red Sea now, but this area here is historically known as the Fertile Crescent because it is, for all of the other desert areas, the Arabian Desert and whatnot, this is an area of great fertility because this is where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers run. This is historically known as the area of Mesopotamia, which literally means the land between the rivers. So because this is what, uh, okay, just thought that just cut out. Because this is uh, watered by those rivers, and then as you get over here, there are plains the, uh, that, that are quite fertile down into, and in some maps include the Nile River Valley. So all of this is known as the Fertile Crescent. It's believed that this is where civilization really began. <laughs> okay, okay, we always have to juggle microphones here. Um, so, the, this area of Mesopotamia, which is known as Sumer, is widely believed to be the place where civilization began. I'm going to put up three circles here. Because this is the first place where there are multiple cities that were connected. Now, what is civilization? We believe that civilization, uh, there are a number of characteristics, cultivated crops, where people were planting crops and not just finding wild grain, the idea of domesticated animals, of irrigation, of the creation of writing. A written, we believe that the Sumerian writing, and I'll look at this in a minute, uh, was the first ever. Particularly the development of cities where people were able to gather together in one place and live, and then also uh, organized religious practices. There are a number of different cities that people believe might be the oldest city in the world. One of them is Shatul Hayek in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. Jericho has a claim to being the oldest or one of the oldest cities in the world. Varanasi in India. Uh, but the general likelihood is that Uruk or uh, one of the cities in here, Eridu or Ur, were probably the first cities. And the Sumerian civilization, because they multiple cities close to one another, they developed a unity there. It's believed that that's probably the home of the first real civilization of human beings. And Ur, as you may know if you're an Old Testament scholar, is where Abraham came from. He started in Ur, and we'll talk about that when we talk about faith and culture in the ancient Near East, um, and then traveled up north and then back down into what we know of as the Holy Land. So this is where civilization, meaning primarily cities, but writing, uh, organized religious practices, cultivated crops, um, and domesticated animals probably began. Writing is one of those characteristics. We believe that the Sumerian writing is the very first writing. Some people claim that the Egyptian hieroglyphs may have been a little bit earlier. They were very close to each other. In fact, the culture of Egypt, as I'll say in a minute, is probably the second oldest culture in the world. There are four places in the world that claim that they may be the start of civilization. Most scholars still believe Sumer, the Mesopotamian area, is first. Egypt is a close second. But then we also have just recently discovered the Indus Valley civilization in Pakistan and India. And if you're staying on till uh, Singapore, I'm gonna be doing a lecture entirely about the Indus Valley civilization. So you'll hear more about that. They didn't even discover that really until the end of the 19th century and they're learning more about it all the time. And the fourth area in the world is the Yellow River Valley in uh, China, which is a very ancient culture as well. But still most scholars believe that Sumer edged those others out. One of the reasons we believe that is because we have the oldest examples of writing. This is ancient Sumerian writing, which at first was pictographic and then later, big thumbs, um, later developed into what's known as cuneiform, which literally means wedge shape. They would take a soft clay tablet and use a wedge shape, a shape stylus. Now this, as you can probably tell, is a pictographic kind of writing meaning that the images on there actually look like the thing that is supposed to be represented. It may not look like much to you, but uh, it's similar to Chinese. There were probably 2,000 original pictographic images in the uh, Sumerian pictographic language. Later they went to cuneiform, which is a phonetic language. 
meaning it represents sounds. English, for instance, in fact, almost all Western languages are phonetic languages. We have 26 characters that represent sounds, and we put them together in different ways to make words. Originally, and in some Asian languages still, they will use pictographs like this. Cuneiform here and here was, was an advancement. I swear I didn't think I pushed that. Gonna have to have an exorcism, I think. Um, <laughs> this civilization, the Sumerian civilization, we have examples, and you can tell from this art down here, the, of domesticated animals, of the use of wheeled carts. Um, this is a tablet from Sumer, and one of the other things that is a sign of uh, civilization was nuclear families. The idea that a mother and father and children formed the basic building block of, of civilization. Now, you think that's natural. We think, of course, that's the case. But not all cultures have done that. In ancient Sparta, for instance, the Greek city of Sparta, um, when children were born, they were raised just to a certain point by their parents, and then they went into a common uh, group home, in effect, so they didn't have the idea of nuclear families. That's not always been universal, but this is an ancient Sumerian tablet where you have a mother and father. You'll also notice that the organized religion thing, this represents the sun god and the moon god who are overlooking the family, and there is cuneiform writing, Sumerian writing, behind it. Okay. So there's an example of nuclear family as part of civilization and also about religion. This image over here, this is called the Venus of Willendorf. It was located in uh, Willendorf in Western Europe. And it, at one point, it's not, I think they found older things then, at one point it was believed to be the oldest human artifact in existence. Um, this has been aged at somewhere between 11,000 and 20,000 years old. And it's, it's a very important, not just because it's so old, but because it represents one of the most common religious images in uh, human history. The idea of a fertility goddess. You will notice that she's a, she's a chubby one. Um, <laughs> and she has pendulous breasts. Both of those were universally accepted symbols of fertility. The fact that she's chubby, she's overweight, means that the crops were fertile. And so there's plenty to eat. The fact that she has pendulous breasts means that she probably had children, which also a sign of fertility. The fertility goddesses, as I mentioned before, were always among the most important deities in all religious, ancient religious beliefs. The other most important were the sky gods, particularly the sun god. You remember with the Nabataeans, they had a mountain god called Tushara, who was also considered the god of the sky. And so those two, the power of the sky god, whether it's the sun or the top of the mountains, and then the importance of the fertility uh, goddess always were critical. This is an example of what a city in ancient Ur is believed to have looked like. I say believe they have found uh, extensive ruins to give them a pretty good idea about that. In the center of any of the ancient Sumerian civilizations, which means the oldest cities in the world, um, we have a central sort of fortified area that typically would be where the royal families and also the priests would live. Usually they would include a temple like this one. Now, how do we know that's what it looked like? Um, and this is, a, this is another example of it. It's because we found them. This is a photograph of a 4,000 year old ziggurat. A ziggurat is a stepped pyramid, whereas you think of pyramids as being straight sides, you know, up to a, a peak. The stepped pyramids would go up and then have a step so that, and this is actually a photograph of the Great Pyramid of Ur that's over 4,000 years old. It was completely covered in sand, which protected it. And now there are photographs of the military. Uh, this is in Iraq, you know, the, which is the area of Mesopotamia, uh, where military soldiers climbing these steps. I, I had a photograph at one point, I don't know what I did with it, of an airplane flying behind it. So this really is a 4,000 year old building. And that's why we know what these look like. Then around this central area, holy moly. We would have a city built. Now, is there anything very strange that you notice about this town? There are no streets. They have found that the ancient cities, the ancient towns in Sumeria and elsewhere frequently would have no streets between them. People would enter their homes by ladder through a central courtyard. And if you wanted to go somewhere else, you climbed up onto your roof and then walked across the roofs of your neighbors to get to wherever you were going. 
I, I guess that's what it means to drop in on your neighbors, right? <laughs> But uh, some of the most ancient examples we have, streets weren't invented until later, okay? Um, the second, probably oldest, and I, I qualify that because some scholars disagree with this. They may think the Yellow River Valley or the Indus Valley would be uh, as old. But we believe the second probably was Egypt. We've talked a lot about Egypt recently. You were just there. The civilization that grew up along the Nile, and you remember we talked about the idea of the upper Nile with the white headdress um, and then the lower Nile uh, crown with the red, and that they were united by Narmer back some 5,000 years ago, somewhere around 3,000 BC. They united the upper and lower um, areas of Egypt into one kingdom. And then in around 2600 BC, that was when the dynasties of the old kingdom began. So we believe that's one of the oldest civilizations as well. It's also true, and I'll talk about this this afternoon, the idea of organized religion. We have much more examples of that in terms of a sophisticated polytheism, I'll explain what that means this afternoon, uh, from Egypt. Uh, very, very sophisticated, very detailed, and the reason for that is because they had over 3,000 years of continuous culture in order to develop the specifics of their religious beliefs. We then end up with the very first true empire probably ever. Now, obviously, Egypt became an empire, but by empire, we usually mean a place that has conquered others, um, the, a, a country, a nation that doesn't just stay within its own borders or just maybe occupy its next door neighbor, but actually branches out and conquers other places. And this is the Akkadian Empire. The Akkadian Empire, which was begun by a man named Sargon, cool name, Sargon, of Acadia. Sargon was a conqueror who spread out from the city of Akkad. Now this is, you see Ur and Eridu, Babylon is here, I'll talk about it in a minute, and Akkad. Akkad was in this same area, but he wasn't satisfied with just being here. He spread the Akkadian Empire, and it's called the Akkadian Empire because the capital city of Akkad, and all the way from the Persian Gulf down here, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea and then down in, along the border of what used to be Phoenicia. And this gives you an idea. From Akkad, they spread north, and he established another major city in the north, and then he sent his armies out in all different directions, conquering peoples all along, so that the Akkadian Empire is one of the earliest, and then we're talking about 2300 BC, so not too long after the start of the Old Kingdom in Egypt. And he begins conquering, and there are great images from the Akkadian Empire. Um, he, they were the first, as far as we know, to use mounted soldiers. And that's one of the things that made them so effective in conquering. And we look at this image of a mounted archer from Acadia, and there's something missing. Can you tell what it is? Stirrups. Stirrups were not invented till much, much later. And if you can imagine what it would be like to ride a horse without stirrups and still be able to shoot a bow, um, they were good. <laughs> this again is that image of Sargon from the side. They developed what uh, these spiral uh, ziggurats that went up. This is an image of Sargon climbing on the shoulders of his uh, warriors, crushing enemy underneath his feet. His feet, and I love this one. This is Sargon, and he's cuddling a lion as though it were a kitten. You know, full mane lion with claws out and he's just cuddling it. This was a symbol of how powerful he was perceived to be in, the, uh, in his empire in that day. And again, remember, he was, this was new. The idea of having military that would go out and conquer other lands and make them, you know, take them over and make them part of your land was quite extraordinary. But the Akkadian Empire, unfortunately later, ran into another Mesopotamian kingdom or empire, and that is the Babylonian Empire. Now, the Babylonian Empire happened in two phases. There was the old, Babylonian Empire, and then Neo-Babylonian, or New Babylonian Empire. This one, and as you can see, they took over much of the same area that the Akkadians had. This was under a guy named Hammurabi. Have you heard of Hammurabi? He is very famous for having written the first law code, as far as we know, in all of history, the Code of Hammurabi. And if you look in the Old Testament, you know the story of the Tower of Babel in the plain of Shinar? Well, there actually is a character in the Bible, uh, it's a, a, by a different name, that is believed to have been Hammurabi. 
um, the name uh, Amraphael. Amraphael in the Bible is thought to be Hammurabi, the plain of Shinar, where the, where the story of the Tower of Babel occurred, is the area around the old Babylonian or first Babylonian empire. So we have that history. And again, following after the model of the Akkadians, they spread out and conquered. We then have one of the most mysterious of kingdoms. And I'm giving you this summary. This is only gonna take about five hours for me to go through all this. But um, the, this area is, was the kingdom of the Hittites. The Hittites came from north of the Black Sea and north of the Black Sea is up in Russia and it's cold. And so at one point somebody said to the king, you know, it's cold. I understand if we go south, it'll be warmer. So they came south of the Black Sea. I made that up, that wasn't, that wasn't real. <laughs> and they uh, conquered a city called Hattusha. There were two other groups of people here at this time. I'm not giving you all the empires. Um, the Hurrians were there. The Hatti is another people that were there. I'm not gonna talk about the Mitanni. I'm just giving you the big ones. Um, and they conquered most of Anatolia, which is what we know of as modern-day Turkey. They then spread over into the edges of Mesopotamia, into the rivers, and conquered all of this area. Um, you'll notice at this time, this is where Egypt was, and this was a high point in Egypt as well. The Hittites are fascinating, we now know, because it's likely they invented the chariot. And that spread very quickly. The Egyptians used chariots, but it's believed that they, they picked them up as an idea from the, uh, the Hittites. They also were the first major users of iron. There had been a Bronze Age, and the Hittites are primarily the ones responsible for bringing the onset of the Iron Age because they developed iron, which was much stronger than bronze. We have lots of images. Almost all of the Hittite images we have are martial images or military images. Um, we have various kings, there are soldiers, and um, we, we see them conquering various peoples. The really interesting thing about the Hittites is that for the longest possible time, they were not thought, thought to exist. All the other records of the ancient cultures, like um, the Egyptian records and the Babylonian records, they talk about another empire and nobody ever knew who they were talking about. And a lot of archeologists or uh, historical anthropologists believe that this was just made up, that they used this as sort of a straw man, a, a foil, and they talked about victories over these great, pe this great military power as just a way of, of boosting themselves. Then, only about 100 years ago, they found in Asia Minor a cache of over 10,000 documents and began to learn that there was an empire called the Hittite Empire. In fact, one of the greatest battles in history was a battle between the Hittites, it was the greatest chariot battle, between the Hittites and the Egyptians. Over 6,000 chariots were involved. And now, once they found that initial cache of documents, you know, clay documents and whatnot, they have found many, many other artifacts so that the Hittite Empire is no longer, there's no longer any question about it, but for many, many years, uh, people who are supposed to know better claimed there wasn't any such empire, even though several of the other empires at that time talked about one. So the Battle of Kadesh, where Egypt and the Hittites fought this huge battle, 6,000 chariots, both, neither side won. In fact, it's the first recorded peace agreement in history, and we now have documents of this peace treaty that they finally said, we'll go home and be quiet. If you'll go home and be quiet, let's leave each other alone. We can't keep doing this. So they did. And when they did, this is the Hittite Empire here, obviously Egypt down here. When they set this peace treaty, the Hittites decided to stay home and, and rest up after these huge battles. That created an opportunity for this area in between Asia, the uh, Hittites and the Egyptians to develop. And we know it as the kingdom of Israel. This is the time of Solomon, of, of King David and Solomon following Saul. And they had the opportunity because the great powers of that day, especially the Hittites and the Egyptians, because they were not bothering anybody anymore for a while, then the, the Israelites had an opportunity for their kingdom to develop. And under David, and especially under Solomon, they became well-known internationally. Solomon was trading down with the Queen of Sheba, which is perhaps 
you know, if you go to Oman, they'll tell you the Queen of Sheba was from Oman. If you go to Ethiopia, they'll tell you the Queen of Sheba was from Ethiopia. But the point is there was international connections taking place at that time so that the kingdom of Israel could develop. Um, here we have the next great empire, and it was the largest empire up till that time, and one of the largest in history. It's the Assyrian Empire. It's hard for you to tell from there, but there's two colors of green here. They should have used something else. This is the first Assyrian Empire. Then later on, they went into a period of recession. When they came back, they grew even more. They uh, up into Asia Minor, down along the both sides of uh, the Arabian Peninsula, and they took over all of Egypt. This was Assyria. <laughs> Here are some of the images. If, if I said the Hittites had mostly uh, military kinds of images, they were nowhere near as militaristic as the Assyrians. Down through history, the Assyrians are known as one of the most militant and cruelest, absolutely merciless against their enemies in war. And that's one of the things that made them so fearsome and why they were able to conquer so much. Um, this is an image up here of them carrying off goods from the lands that they conquered. And down here we have images of men being flayed alive, cutting their skin off while they're still alive. Here we have a, an Assyrian soldier piling up heads that have been cut off of their opponents. Um, here we have uh, people being carted off into slavery. This is King Jehu, Jehu of the northern kingdom of Israel at that point, bowing down before King Ashurbanipal of Assyria. They were a tough bunch. In 722, the kingdom of Assyria, remember I told you that Israel had had a chance to really develop because the Hittites and the Egyptians were not bothering anybody for a while, but when the Assyrians came along, that all stopped. By that point, Israel had broken up into two parts. There was the northern kingdom, very confusingly called the kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom called the kingdom of Judah. In 722, the Assyrians come sweeping in and attack the northern kingdom of Israel, which had their capital in Samaria, and they destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, and they carried them off into captivity. The, um, the, the, I'll go ahead to this map. The idea of the ten, there were mostly ten of the Israeli tribes, or the Israelite tribes in the north, they were carried off into captivity. That's where we get the lost tribes of Israel because those were from here in the north, the capital of Samaria, they were carried off some probably along this route. One of the things the Assyrians did is when they conquered a people, they took them off into captivity, forced them to intermarry with others, and therefore, in that way, they figured they'd never get the energy back together in order to try to rebel. They no longer were a, a, a uh, contiguous people. So the 10 tribes of Israel were carried off to be lost, and they are the lost tribes of Israel. A, a, an interesting side note, one of the clients that I work with is Jewish Voice Ministries. They, are, they work to serve Jewish people around the world, and we have discovered now a number of different tribal groups in different parts of the world, Africa and India, for instance, that have always claimed to be descended from the nations of Israel. And they have started to do genetic testing. See, they, they never could prove it. Uh, sociologists and whatnot would always say, oh yeah, forget it. Even though they spoke a language similar to Hebrew, they used Hebrew names, they had ritual kind of religious practices very similar to ancient, um, the ancient Jewish religion. Although sometimes it got a little weird. There's one tribe, the Elba, and they circumcised their boys not at eight days, like the ancient Jews or, or the Jewish people today too, but at eight years. I think eight, eight days would be better. Uh, but it, it, they now have identified the uh, several tribes in Ethiopia, um, the tribe of Limba in Zimbabwe, um, the, the um, Benai Masai, uh, Manasse in India, that genetically they have proven they really are descended, some of them from the lost tribes in the north. Others are scattered because the Jews have been you know, they have been spread out so many times. They were, they were driven out of England, they were driven out of Spain. Um, that they are identifying that there are Jewish people in other parts of the world that really are directly descended. And we now can, they never could test for genetics until quite recently, all right? So the lost tribes of Israel. You'll notice this little area here, Judah, um, the, the southern kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem as the capital. If you look at any maps, well, I'll show you another one in a minute, that show the Assyrian Empire, it covers everything, but there's always this little area right here. 
because after the Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, they went south to Jerusalem to attack the southern kingdom of Judah and the city of Jerusalem. And the Assyrian army is parked outside, and this is during the time where uh, King Hezekiah is the king, and Isaiah is his counselor, the prophet. The prophet Isaiah gets a word from God and says to Hezekiah, don't give in, don't surrender, you know, it, it'll all be okay. And like the Assyrians were destroying everybody. But Hezekiah held out because Isaiah told him that God wanted him to. And then, there's, it's a wonderful, in the older versions of the, of the Hebrew Bible, it says something like, and the next morning the Assyrians woke to find themselves dead. <laughs> and the, the, you know, the biblical idea is that God had sent, had destroyed a significant number of their soldiers. The, those who don't go as much for the Bible version say that it was apparently some sort of epidemic. That they, you know, they got very sick. So Ashurbanipal turns around and takes all of his soldiers back to his home, uh, which is at that point was in Nineveh, um, here. And the first example of political spin in all of history, in the records, Ashurbanipal has written, I defeated King such and such and King such and such, and I defeated the armies of King such and such, and I penned the King of Jerusalem up in his city like a bird in a cage. <laughs> he didn't defeat him. So to try to make it sound as good as possible, he said, I pinned him up in his city like a bird in a cage. But any map you look up, look at at the Assyrian Empire, it covers all of this area except for the southern kingdom of Judah, which they never did defeat. Okay? Great story. All right. We then have the Neo-Babylonian Empire. The Assyrians were all of it for a long time. And then the Babylonian Empire comes back into its own. It grows up, and this is from 650 to 539 BC. And again, starting in Babylon, it takes over Asher, Nineveh, most of the areas that had been, not Egypt, uh, but most of the areas that had been part of the Assyrian Empire. So the Neo-Babylonians. Interestingly, whereas the Assyrians didn't have any luck with Jerusalem, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. This is an artist's rendition of the ancient city of Babylon. Um, here you get a picture of it as well with the rivers flowing through it. It was apparently an extraordinary city. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world were the hanging gardens of Babylon, which apparently the king of the Babylonians had had built for his, his wife, who was a princess. And she had come from a much more fertile um, green place. And so he built the hanging gardens of Babylon so she would have some place she felt more at home because of all the trees and whatnot. This is the, the uh, Gate of Ishtar which is now in Berlin. It was one of the great gates leading into the city of Babylon, the Babylonian Empire. This is what it looks like. There are these beautiful glazed tiles in blue and other colors. It's now in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. So you can go to Berlin and see this Babylonian site. Um, and they believe that Babylon at one point had more than 50,000 people living in it, um, the city of Babylon, and which made it by far the largest city in the world at that time. King Nebuchadnezzar, this is a photograph of King Nebuchadnezzar uh, of biblical fame. His father, Nebuchadnezzar, had actually expanded the kingdom, but then Nebuchadnezzar did even more with it. Nebuchadnezzar is well known, again, from Old Testament times. He had, um, he had gotten the southern kingdom of Judah, which the Assyrians had not been able to conquer, for several years. They had agreed to be under his control and so they were paying taxes and things like that but he was leaving them alone and but they kept rebelling and they kept rebelling and and so eventually he got tired of it in 586 king nebuchadnezzar took his armies to the city of jerusalem he destroyed the temple of jerusalem and he destroyed the city of jerusalem and at that point um the the city was destroyed and they took the uh, many of the people most of the people from the city of jerusalem in captivity into Babylon and this is if you look at the Old Testament the book of Daniel is all about this he, about the Daniel was one of the young nobles from Israel that was taken into Babylon and was was brought up to be part of the court in Babylon it's um, Daniel Shadrach Meshach and Abednego remember those guys my w wife grew up and they always called it shake a bed, make a bed, and to bed we go. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the three characters. And so they were taken off into captivity. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed. But they were only held, unlike the Assyrians that spread the, the northern kingdom Israelites out, 
The southern kingdom of Judeans, and by the way, that's where we get the word Jew, because Judea was the, the, the last of the, the Jewish people that were together. The people of Judea, after only about 48 years, were allowed to go back home, not because the Babylonians let them go back home. They were kept together. They didn't get spread out the way the northern kingdom had. But along comes the next great empire, which at this point, the largest empire in history, which is the Persian Empire. Persia, of course, is the ancient um, culture of Iran. In fact, in Iran, they still speak Persian, or it's sometimes called Farsi. So the Persian Empire, which spread all the way over into uh, areas of Pakistan, over, over into Asia, took over all of Asia Minor, uh, what we know of as Turkey, all the way into Thrace, Macedonia. And this is one of the reasons that later on, the favorite son of Macedonia, whose name is Alexander the Great, um, hated the Persians. Why? Because they had conquered his country, his father's country, at one point. They took over all of Egypt, Libya. They were really significant in terms of control. Um, and the Persians had a very different idea. Most other empires, when they took over a, another country, they would force that other country into slavery. They would force them to obey their laws, uh, obey, uh, follow their gods, etc. Well, Cyrus the Great, the guy who was the first, uh, the, uh, the Persian leader, who conquered Babylon, and this is in the book of Daniel, by the way, if you're interested in reading it, it actually talks about when this happened. He believed the best way to keep people on your side if you conquer them was give them their freedom. So he told, after only 48 years in captivity, he told the people of the southern kingdom of Judah, you can go home if you want. You can go back to Israel. You can go back to Jerusalem. And some of them did, not a lot, because after you know 48 years, they had best part of two generations had gotten used to living where they were in Babylon. But if you read the books of um, Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament, those are the stories of the return. When Cyrus the Great of Persia told them that they could go back home after being in captivity under Babylon. And there are all these wonderful images. Most of these you can see in the British Museum in London. Um, so uh, a, an extraordinary culture. They, the thing that the, the Persians did, however, I'll throw in a couple of European things here because it's important. The next major civilizations that come along are the Minoan civilization on Crete. Have you been to Crete and seen some of the extraordinary? It's the oldest civilization in Europe proper because Crete is considered part of Europe. Um, and amazing palaces and beautiful quaffed images of women and just extraordinary things, including that they used to vault live bulls as a sport, right? Have you seen that? It's like they weren't using capes and stuff. They would vault over these bulls as, as a favorite sport. Better them than me. Um, so Minoan civilization, and then the next major civilization, which comes from the Peloponnesian Peninsula, uh, Peninsula which is part of Greece, was the Mycenaean civilization, which conquered Minoa. I mention those two only because they led to the uh, Greek civilization, primarily the Athenian Empire, and the Athenian Empire caused a problem because technically all of the area the Athenian Empire has claimed had belonged to Persia. And so Persia invades Greece to try to stop all of that. And that's where we get the great stories like uh, the Greeks were not expected to do very well against the Persian army, the largest army in history. And yet when the Persians invaded the mainland of Greece, they had a big battle on the plains of Marathon, and much to their surprise, the Greeks won. And because they were so surprised they had won, they expected to lose, one of their soldiers was sent with the message back to Athens, the capital, to tell them we had won. And so he ran, how far? 20, 20, 20 well, 26, 27 miles, 26.2 miles. The reason why today a modern marathon race is that distance is because that's how far he ran from the plains of Marathon to Athens in order to inform them that they actually had won the battle against the Persians and then he fell dead, which is exactly what I would have done if I tried to run 26.2 miles. Um, and so they defeated the Persians. There ended up being several other, the Persians later on decided to come over by land, and there you have the battle of Thermopylae, where 300 Spartans, plus a few Thebans and others, uh, were responsible for stopping them. You saw the movie 300, right? Yeah. Gerard Butler, Rippling Abs, all of that. If you haven't, 
ladies, you should watch that movie. Uh, exciting history. Well, because of the, the anger over having Persia invade Greece and Macedonia and control it for a while, we have the rise of the, I believe, the most underappreciated character in history, and that is Philip of Macedon, or Philip of Macedonia. Philip of Macedonia was the king of Macedonia, which is what we know of and think of as northern Greece now. It technically was not Greece, although they loved the Greek culture, the story of the Greek heroes, they spoke Greek, there was also a Macedonian language. Well, he developed a military with the plan of attacking Persia, defeating Persia, you know, getting rid of their old enemy. Persia controlled the most part of the known world then, but little Macedonia was going to go after him. Well, he was assassinated. His son, who had been a general in his armies in his early 20s and had developed great military skill, is a guy that we know of as Alexander. Alexander of the third of Macedonia or Alexander the Great. They didn't call him that until he conquered most of the known world and then he was great. Um, this apparently is very much what he looked like. They say he was loved by women and men alike. Um, this, this is a famous um, image of him, a mosaic of him and here it is. He is fighting against the Persian king. You'll notice, if you can see this, that this is Alexander and his horse is going that way. Well, this is the king of Persia, and his horse is going that way, too. <laughs> because um, every time, and, and Philip, uh, I'm sorry, um, Alexander got his forces together, and he crossed over the, to Asia Minor, Persian land. He started a campaign. This is the eventual empire of Alexander the Great. But he started a campaign. I thought I had a different, uh, uh, different image there. That, and I'm going to do a whole talk about Alexander the Great and Hellenism later on in the trip. Uh, Alexander started fighting the Persian army, and they kept running from him. They'd fight a battle and then get and then run away because he was never uh, he was always outnumbered. Alexander was he never lost a battle. Most of the time he was outnumbered five to one or more, and he never was defeated by the Persians. The Persians at one point, the, the king of Persia, writes him a letter and says, I'll tell you what, I will let you keep all of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, and I will give you all this gold and silver if you'll just go back home. Well, Alexander writes back to him and says, in the future when you write to me, you speak to me as the ruler. And he said, and forget it. Well, one of his, his generals, one of Alexander's generals, um, uh, I think it was Lycomanus, he said, you know, if I had been Alexander, I would have taken that deal. And Alexander said, if I'd been like a manis, I would have too. <laughs> he believed that he was ordained to become the ruler of the world. <coughs> you heard a little bit in, uh, we talked about Egypt, that he came to Egypt, he was welcomed, and they declared him to be the son of Zeus Amun, which is the Greek and, and uh, Egyptian gods, the high gods put together. He said, cool, I knew it. <laughs> I knew all the time that I was divine. His soldiers got tired of him because they had been friends of his growing up, and they, they got tired of him claiming to be divine and all of that. But he ended up creating the largest empire in the world. You'll notice he was down here in Egypt. They accepted him as a ruler. He went back up. One of our guides said, um, well, he came to Egypt, and he was, but then he didn't have much time to enjoy it because he died a little while later. She didn't mention the fact that he then took over most of Asia, uh, or at least most of, of uh, uh, Western Asia. He travels over and takes over one city after another city after another city. He defeats elephants. He would do things like charge across a river uphill into the face of war elephants and a much larger body, and he never lost. Well, they got all the way over here to India, and he wanted to go all the way to the Great Sea over here. And as I'll tell you later, his, his soldiers, his generals were going, Al, 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 we want to go home. It's been 10 years that they were traveling like that. So they started back, ended up getting back to Babylon, which he wanted to make the capital of his new empire, and he dies at age 32. As someone said, by the time Alexander was my age, he'd been dead for 28 years. Um, so this was the empire of Alexander the Great. He did not have any male heirs. And so on his deathbed, his generals are gathered around and they say, Alexander, who is gonna control your kingdom, your, your empire after you die? And the story is that he said, to the strongest, which 
as far as the generals could tell, that meant war. So there was a huge war, the War of the Diadochi, which means the successors after Alexander, and they ended up finally uh, coming to an agreement that they would break the kingdom up into several parts. I'm fading out again. Um, the Seleucus, one of his generals, controlled all of India over into Mesopotamia. Um, he had the general Antigonus would control most of the area of the, the Middle East and up Asia Minor. And then Ptolemy took over all of Egypt. You remember that we talked about the Ptolemaic um, dynasties. Cleopatra was the last of the Ptolemies. She was a Greek descendant, but she controlled Egypt. And then uh, Cassander and Lycomachus controlled some of the area up here. Later on, it shifted around and Seleucus ended up controlling much more area. Antigonus kind of got pushed out of the picture. Around the same time, eventually, the Persian Empire grew and pushed out the Greek influence pretty much, and they created a new Parthian Empire. The Parthian Empires were the, the, the boogeymen to the Romans. It's said that Roman mothers, whenever they wanted to tell their children that they needed to behave, they would say, you behave or the Parthians will come and get you. Because the Romans tried to continue to move. It's what my dogs do when they're frustrated. The Romans tried to keep going further and further east, and they ran into the Parthians, and the Parthian army delivered the worst defeat to the Romans they had ever experienced. Um, the, they had 40,000 soldiers on the Roman side against a smaller per, uh, Parthian force. 30,000 Romans were killed. Mm. And so the Romans decided, we don't want to do this again. So they left them alone. And I want you to notice, this was the border of the Parthian Empire. The Roman Empire comes along, and if you look, it's exactly the Parthians were over here, and the Romans left them alone. But the Romans come along, this is their time, they conquer everything from Britain, all of Western Europe, the Iberian Peninsula, all of North Africa, Egypt, the Middle East, um, all of this. In fact, they, they said at that time the Mediterranean was a Roman lake, and they controlled everything around uh, the, the Mediterranean Sea. At a certain point, however, it became too much to manage. They ended up having 27 emperors in 40 years. You know, they had a couple of good periods. What happened was Julius Caesar was never emperor, but he ended up pretty much developing a military that the Romans were afraid of him after having had a republic for a long, long time, 500 years. In fact, the story is, if you wonder about Brutus and Julius Caesar, uh, there had been a king in Rome until about 500 BC. The last king was, was called Tyrannus Superbus. <coughs> Superbus, he thought well of himself. He raped a noblewoman. And so all the other noblemen got together and they chased him out of Rome. And they said, never again will we have a king. And they developed the Republic, the Roman Republic, which lasted about 500 years until the time of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, who conquered all of the uh, Germanic tribes and everything, crosses the river, you know, the, um, and comes back into Rome, even though they ordered him not to, they ordered him to expand. And they finally, when he got there with his army, they said, okay, Julius, and he was sort of put in charge, but not as king. Then Caesar was assassinated. The interesting thing is that the uh, Superbus, the guy who had raped a noble woman and was driven off, the guy responsible primarily for doing that was named Brutus. 500 years later, when Julius Caesar comes along and people who had been his friends end up assassinating him, they were led by Brutus, who is a direct descendant of the guy who swore we will never again have a king. And so Brutus, although he's a friend of Julius Caesar's, decided it was more important to get rid of this guy before he becomes a tyrant than it is for me to honor my friendship to him. And so Brutus led the campaign that assassinated Julius Caesar. But after that, Caesar's adopted son, who was a, a relative by the name of Octavian, he takes Caesar's name, ends up coming to power, was and eventually became called Caesar Augustus, the August one. And they had some really good emperors early on, and then they got into some really terrible ones, Caligula and Nero and others whose name you have heard. Eventually, they get down to the point where the emperor Diocletian decided, and this is in the end of the third century, um, the 290s, 
He decided the problem was two things. One, we didn't have a good successor program after having 27 different Caesars in 40 years. We needed a better way to decide who the next Caesar is going to be. And secondly, it's too much for one person to run anyway. And so he divided the kingdom up in two. You'll notice the line here. There was Western Europe and North Africa, and then Egypt, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe, as what we would think of as Eastern Europe. And each of those places had an Augustus, a, a, main, a main guy, and then a Caesar, a second level. And the point was, they would go 20 years, and then the Augustus would step aside, and his junior guy, the Caesar, would take over, and they would appoint a new junior one. He thought it was a great plan. He then retired to the Dalmatian coast. If you go to uh, Croatia today, you can go to his main palace um, there and wonderful things. Well, this didn't really work because one of the Caesars that they appointed was named Constantius. His son, who was in charge of his army, was named Constantine. Constantine decided that, and when he was named as the Caesar in replace of his father, he said, I don't want to wait 20 years and still be the second guy. So he conquered all of this area and he became the Roman Emperor Constantine only he didn't want to stay in Rome Rome had become kind of backward to him so he moved the Empire over here to the city of Byzantium and he renamed it New Rome but everybody else didn't like that name they started calling it Constantinople after Constantine and this was the point at which they still had, uh, just for management purposes, they still, although he united it, they still broke it up in two halves. There was the, the eastern, eastern half, which primarily spoke Greek, and the western half, which spoke Latin, which still had its center in Rome. Well, this is how it was broken up. Eventually, we get the period of the migrations. My, the period of migration, which as you can see is about the first, from about 100 to 500 uh, uh, AD, what they call common era now. And this is when people from the Far East kept moving, these barbarian tribes and Turks and Mongols and all sorts of things are moving around. There are Ostrogoths and Visigoths and you know all kinds of people. They start moving and conquering and taking over more land and more land. And at this point in time, Rome, see Constantinople is not bothered by all this over here. It's all Western Europe. We get to the point where Rome had gotten so weak by the early 400s that any, anybody with three friends and a pair of boots thought they could conquer Rome. And so all of these various tribes start coming in and sacking and looting. Rome itself is looted twice. By 476, it's being controlled by outside barbarian uh, troops. And finally, um, a, one of the barbarian leaders displaces the last of the Roman emperors from Rome. And they, in 476, the Western Roman Empire pretty much ended. If you ask people, when did the Roman Empire end? They'll usually say late 400s. But the real center of the Roman Empire at that point was the Eastern Roman Empire based in Constantinople which Constantine had formed, that lasted for another thousand years until 1453. And the beauty of uh, Istanbul today, what had been Constantinople, the palaces, later on the mosques, all of that is a product of the fact that they, this is the golden age for the Eastern Roman Empire, even after Rome had fallen. Particularly in the 500s, 100 years or so after the fall of Rome, we have the Emperor Justinian and the Empress Theodora. Now, Constantine was the first Roman Empire that, emperor that made Christianity legal. After him, there was one emperor, Julian, who wanted to go back to the old Roman gods. He's known as Julian the Apostate in the history books. But he was the only one. Theodosius was an emperor that came after Constantine who made Christianity the legal religion of the Roman Empire. And so these are Christian rulers Julian and Theodora come along in the 500s and they do a lot, in fact I'll show you, they do a significant amount to try to recover the glory of Rome. Not all of it, but they do a pretty good job of it. Um, they, for instance, built the Hagia Sophia. They didn't have the, the spires at that point because it wasn't a mosque. Later on when the, uh, when the Islamic armies conquer it, they turn it into a mosque, but it was the largest church in the Christian world, that the Statue of Liberty can stand, this is, this is the inside of the Hagia Sophia.
and you can't tell, but the people are down here, little tiny people. The Statue of Liberty can stand upright minus her torch under the dome of the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Um, and it was built in the 500s. This is also the ruler who built St. Catherine's Monastery, where many of you just went. So this is in the 500s. Um, beautiful, beautiful mosaics and paintings in the Hagia Sophia. Most of them were painted over when it was a mosque. And then later, after Ataturk, um, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, really changed Turkey after the First World War, he decided that in order to relate to the Western world, which is one of his big goals, is to, is to have commerce, that he had, to, he had to do something about the most important Christian church in history having been turned into a mosque. So he removed the paint, or had the paint removed from all of the Christian symbols, and turned it into a museum. If you go there today, you will see both Islamic and Christian symbolism in the Hagia Sophia. Have you been to the Hagia Sophia? Okay, get off the next stop and go, if you haven't, because, no, just kidding. It is really an experience. So this is the new Roman Empire by the, the after the mid part of the 500s. This gives you some idea. This outline, the green outline, is where the Roman Empire, that is the Eastern Roman Empire under uh, Justinian by 565, that was where it was. But you'll notice the yellow parts here is where Christianity was. And it's outside that because most of the barbarian groups, the Franks, the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, all of those had converted to Christianity after having conquered Western Europe. And so even outside the then Christian Roman Empire, we had the Christian faith was being spread. Later on, Charlemagne, uh, around the uh, late 700s and uh, 800, he got named the, um, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. He really spread Christianity. But then in the start of the 600s, we have a new influence in the world. And that is, in 570, a man is born in Saudi Arabia. It wasn't Saudi Arabia then, it was just Arabia. He was born in the city of Mecca, um, named Muhammad. The pro and Muhammad, when he was 40 years old, in 610, he started having visions. He would go up into the hills around Mecca to meditate in caves, and he started having visions that God was calling him to clean up the religion, to do two things, really, to get rid of all the idols that the people in, in Arabia were worshiping. Many of them were pagan idols, uh, worshipers. But also, he believed that Judaism and Christianity, or he, he felt God was telling him, Judaism and Christianity were inspired by God and were true, but they had gotten corrupted. And so his job was to clean them up. So in 610, he, st he tells first his wife, and she accepts this as being true, and then other close followers, and Islam begins. So an image of Muhammad, if there are any Muslims in the group. Which sounds very well indeed. Uh, well, do you have a very relaxing afternoon at sea on board the Star Legend. I'll speak to you again very soon. Okay, I'm sorry I've gone so long. Three more minutes and we're done. Yes, um, I started to say I apologize to any Muslims that are in the group because representing an image of Muhammad sometimes is done for educational purposes, but that's not considered um, a, a right thing to do. I wouldn't say kosher. <laughs> Maybe it's not considered halal. Okay. Um, so... This orange area down here is the area that were, was conquered before Muhammad's death in uh, 632. You'll notice that part of Oman, Oman is very proud of the fact that they were some of the earliest converts to Islam, even though Islam in um, Oman is of a different type. You have Sunni, is more than 80%, Shia, but then there are some other smaller groups. And in Oman, they have Ibadi Islam. I'll talk about that when we talk about understanding Islam. After his death, there were four caliphs called the Rashidun, or rightly guided caliphs. They conquered all of this area that you see in yellow. And then following that, the Umayyad Caliphate was the next group. They conquered all of the rest of the Maghreb, which is the northwestern part of, I swear I am not hitting that button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need thumb therapy. Um, <laughs> and all the way up in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. In fact, a lot of people don't realize that the uh, Muslim forces got all the way up almost to Paris. The Battle of Tours, Charles Martel, 
finally defeated the Muslim armies outside Tours in France, and their, their intention was to take over all of Western Europe, and he defeated the armies there. He was the grandfather of Charlemagne, of Charles the Great. Um, and then they conquered also all the way over here into, this is the reason that we have Persia um, and is, is Islamic and why Pakistan, you know, parts of India. We'll talk about that later. Christianity later splits in two in, in the 11th century between Western Christianity, which is Latin, what we know as Roman Catholicism, Eastern Christianity, which was Greek, and it's what we know of as the Orthodox churches, uh, Rome being the center of Western Christianity, Latin Christianity, and uh, Constantinople being the center of Eastern Christianity. That's why you have Roman uh, Catholicism and the Orthodox churches as being separate. We'll talk about that under the faith and culture. Later on in the 1100s, we have the, the Muslim Seljuk Turks. They actually were nomadic peoples from Turkmenistan and elsewhere who came over and ended up taking, taking over most of this part of the world, including most of the Byzantine Empire. This is Asia Minor again. The Mongol Empire comes along in the 1200s and conquers. Uh, the Mongol Empire was the largest contiguous, that is, uh, altogether empire in the history of the world. Only the British Empire is bigger, and it was in a lot of different places. And the Mongols were a little different. They ended up creating four major khanates, or four major kingdoms, after Genghis Khan's death. But they were different in that, for the most part, with the exception of China, which the Kublai Khan ended up controlling, for the most part, they weren't interested in maintaining the land. They just wanted to conquer it, to get the benefit from it, and in many cases, they were extraordinarily destructive. It's estimated that half of the population of the Iranian uh, plateau died under the Mongols, uh, as much as a third of the population of the Eastern Europe that they got into. They killed as many as 60 million people. There weren't as many people back then, so that was a lot. So the Mongols conquered. And then we end up with the Ottoman Empire. This is the largest extent, the Muslim Ottoman Empire in the, the 16th, uh, 15th century, 1500s, 16th century. Later on, the uh, Ottoman Empire would become this. It was Eastern Europe. And the Ottomans, by the way, we sometimes forget, they were right outside the gates of Vienna, the Muslim armies, for a long time. There was always, in fact, one of the reasons Protestantism was able to grow as it did is because every time the Holy Roman Emperor decided he was going to crack down on Protestants because he was Catholic, there would be another threat in Europe that, uh, from the Muslims that he had to go take care of. And so he was not able to intercede to prevent Protestantism from growing. The Ottoman Empire controlled Eastern Europe, all of Anatolia, down into Saudi Arabia, all of North Africa, but that was in the uh, 1600s. Eventually, it got weaker and weaker and weaker, and the countries in Eastern Europe shed the Ottoman Empire control. Uh, the Ottoman Empire became known as the sick old man of Europe because they simply weren't able to maintain themselves. And in the Second World War, the Ottoman Empire made the terrible mistake of joining with, I'm sorry, the First World War made the terrible mistake of joining Germany and Austro-Hungary uh, Hungary in um, as allies when they were defeated. The Ottoman Empire was completely broken up into various other countries. That's all I'm going to talk about empires. Thank you for your patience, but this is where you can get these. We'll talk this afternoon about religious cultures.